Okay, guys, I'd just like to welcome Mr. Garrick to our class. You were all super interested in um, our study of A Long Way Gone and Sierra Leone and all the different things that we talked about. Um, and I'm honored that Mr. Garrick could join us today to share a little bit of his story with you. You know, um, first and foremost, let me say that um, I really appreciate the fact that um, Madam Grillo, I don't mind to say Madam Grillo, you know, <laughs> Madam Grillo has, um, has been so dedicated to um, this story and, and um, using, uh, using the book for over the years. It's not an easy read, you know, because of all the traumatic things that you have to read about in the book, you know, so um, I really appreciate the fact that um, I mean, she has done this, and I think, I think this happened after I gave the talk. Mm -hmm. and when I gave the talk the first time um, in the school, and she became interested, you know. Now, if I have to discuss the civil war in Sierra Leone, I want to discuss it from three different perspectives. One, the reasons. And, and I would take it from the reasons that the givers give. You understand? Can you understand me, what I'm saying? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah, I would like to take it from that perspective first. The reasons that the rebels gave, gave you understand, for the, um, for the incursion. One thing that I've, that I've discovered in all of the different re I mean, readings that are out there about the war is the fact that um, they haven't really mentioned how the war in Liberia affected Sierra Leone. Because the war in Liberia actually started in 1989 and went on till 1997. At that time, we were very peaceful. But Sierra Leone was in a difficult state where people were poverty stricken. It was difficult for people to make a living. And you know, um, we were working, we were not getting paid. Even when I was a teacher there, we would go for three months and don't even get paid. People make like $10 a month. And the, the, the staple food, which is rice, was much more expensive. And a lot of people cannot even afford to buy. Let's say for instance, you get paid $10 a month. And the staple food, a bag of rice, costs like probably $20. And you only get paid once a month. Once a month. So you can imagine people going without salaries for like two, three months. So the government was corrupt. And I'm quite sure in the book, they mentioned about the APC government, All People's Congress. The government was corrupt. But when the war started in Liberia, we had um, the president we had at the time was um, um, Shaka Stevens. So. It was so terrible in Liberia. It was led by Charles Taylor. And um, it got to a point where now the rebel movement were divided into two different factions. Now you have Charles Taylor and you have, I think, Prince Johnson at the time. Then you have the government forces. Okay. These rebels said that um, they were concerned about the corruption in the country. That's, the, that's one of their reasons, and that's probably the epicenter of their um, rebellion. If they say they were concerned about corruption, let's face it, why are you gonna start attacking people, maiming them, killing them, putting them through that kind of a traumatic situation. For instance, in the book where they captured um, um, Ishmael Beer, I mean the rebels, look, look what they did to the old man. Okay? That's, that's the situation. That's exactly what they were doing. And you understand? Let's say for, let me give you a scenario. Let's say, for instance, they attacked William Starr and, and they've already um, caved in where it's not easy for people to escape. What they would do? They would capture the young, the young kids under, under 18, 17, and force them to fight by drugging them. Okay? And 
guy there, they would execute s some of the parents in front of their kids, or they would kill the children in front of the parents. Just imagine you're standing there and your four or five kids are being executed, or probably they're getting them to stretch their hands and they ask them, do you want long sleeve or short sleeve? Meaning, where are they going to get your hand chopped off? You understand? It was really tough. So that was, that was the reason they gave. They said because of corruption. But they were corrupt, the way they went about it. Because now the innocent civilians were caught up in this, in this whole situation. You know, and by the way, that's how that's how they killed my brother too. Because they killed my brother during the war, and I lose so many of my friends. I always say that if I was in Sierra Leone, probably I wouldn't be alive. You know, because um, people were attacking people in in indiscriminately. You know, so um, that's one. Then the other the other aspects of the war that I that I was totally, totally, totally against that I hated. And that has left a scar. It has left an, an indelible scar on the history of Sierra Leone. And I don't want to say, be selfish. This is not only about Sierra Leone. Every country in the world where there is a civil war or whether it's terrorism, young kids are being indoctrinated. Young kids don't have the capacity to go out and commit atrocities. Young kids don't have the capacity to go out and maim people. Young children don't have the capacity to go out and rape other people. Young kids, you understand? And older, older people. Because our culture, the way we grow up, we respect our elders. We address, we address older people as sir or madam or yes sir, yes ma. Yes, that's where we go. And even when we were in school, seriously, we were afraid of our teachers than even our parents. Not that we are not afraid of our parents. Because when our teachers call home and say, we are not doing well, I can give you guys an example. When I was in high school, I, um, I, I, I failed a math quiz. And the teacher flogged me so bad, there were marks on my back. I went home, I told my dad, and my dad said, oh, I'm going to go talk to him, I'm going to go talk to him. If we have to cry abuse, there will be no one left in the town. My dad came to school, thinking that my dad was going to fight for me. When, when the teacher told him that I failed my, my math quiz, he asked the teacher to flog me again. Since that day, I, I, I would never come home and tell him anything. I just, I just took the, be the beating. I think that's why I was so afraid of math until I came to the United States. And even when I came here, when I had to go to college for my associate degree, when we went there and they said I have to do math, I told my wife, I said, well, I'm going to quit. <laughs> because I was so afraid. Because in Sierra Leone, really, if I was going to study fine arts or you're going into theater, that kind of stuff, you don't, need, you don't need math. You don't take math at university level unless you're going into the sciences. So when I came here, when they said I had to do math, I mean, I, I had to do math, I, I, I was ready to quit. My wife was the one. I have to give her the credit. She was the one who said, you can do it. Don't quit. You can. You know. So that's how we respected our parents. So when you look at what was going on in Sierra Leone at the time, there was no respect for nobody. Kids, younger kids, older people, you understand? You know, it, was, it was really terrible. You know, it, it was really a terrible situation. Then, then, but I think what happened, because when the war in Liberia was so bad, um, the economic community, it's an organization, decided to step in and say, you guys have to stop this. So they needed a country where, because Liberia and Sierra Leone, we share the same border. Okay, we, we share the same border. So they needed a country that they would use as a base. So for the, for the peace talks, you understand? So they sent the Nigerian peacekeeping force, if I can remember, I was young, Ekomog at the time, and then they had the meeting there. Charles Taylor, who was the main leader of, the, of that rebel movement in Liberia, was mad. He was mad because he had, I mean, a large percentage of the country under control, and control not in a nice way. 
you know, because they were, they were placed on the fear, you know. So he was mad. And I remember that the, he, he said that as long as they were using Sierra Leone as a base for the peace stop or for ECOMOG, because ECOMOG is a peacekeeping force of soldiers from the various West African countries, you understand? As long as they were using Sierra Leone, he was going to make sure that they destabilized Sierra Leone. So that's where it started. But most of the writings, they would say that the war was just against, okay? And what he did, then now we had a rebel leader by, by the name of Fode Sankor, who was leading the revolutionary, what is the middle one? Revolutionary what front? United. United. United front, yes. He was leading, he was leading that. So, what happened was, Charles Taylor supported him, and yes, the country was unhappy, we were in abject poverty. The, the government, APC government, was corrupt at the time, okay? And he said he's leading a rebellion. Where did they start to attack? They started attacking the mining areas. Why were they attacking the mining areas? Because they were going to use the diamonds to fuel the war. And that's exactly what happened. So he supported, he supported um, um, Fode Sanko. And then you have these young, young youths who were unhappy, okay, who decided to be part of it. Some of them voluntarily, some involuntarily, because they were captured. And they were first, they were coerced to fight beyond the Oriya, okay? So that's, that's exactly what happened. And then they started attacking those areas. And um, we, were, we were in complete disbelief at the time, you know, because we were in denial. Even when, just like in the book, when they were spreading the information that um, they're attacking people or they're killing people or they this, you know, people still were in denial, you understand? Until you start to see evidence of it, okay? And that's exactly what happened there too, you understand? Until you start to see ev evidence. So even when Ishmael Beer was in Matsgujam, and I could relate to Ishmael Beer a lot, because Ishmael, Ishmael Beer was a young kid. Remember? He was a dancer, you know, a rapper and that kind of stuff, and they, and they were into making music. We actually, we actually started Discord. There, that's a part that, uh, I don't know if Madame, um, I mean, Madame Grillo knows that about me. Oh, but we, we, we started disco dancing in Sierra Leone, because, <laughs> Because before, before the 80s, it wasn't even cool to be part of the band. You know, we, we had bands, and um, because the people who were in bands at the time, they were dropouts from school. You understand? So if you say you, you are in a band, you are a failure to your family. So, not, not, so none of that, I mean, social stuff was not accept, acceptable norm in our society. But um, when we were in high school, we formed a dancing group called the Davalji Brothers. Maybe you guys might look it up later. D-A-V-A-L-G-E-E, -E, Davalji Brothers. And we started all this disco dancing. We were very, very popular. We used, so like, like, I mean, Ishmael Bia mentioned that um, they went to Matuja. We used to travel too. We would go to Bo to perform. We would go to all these different places to perform. They would ask us to come and perform, you know. And... Um, that's what that's 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 why I can relate to him in that in that aspect, you know. So probably we too. Well, at that time I wasn't dancing anymore because by the time I, I left Sierra Leone in 1991, I left Sierra Leone in 1991 in September. But during that time, I had a friend who was in the military who was actually fighting the rebel war, and he was telling me about all these things because. He would take a break and come to Freetown, which is the capital city, and he would explain all these things to me that was going on. Then prior to that, my brother was in Liberia, 
somebody came from Liberia and they said, I've left Liberia, I wanted your brother to come, but he refused. Because they all knew what was going on, you know. And these soldiers who were fighting the rebels, they were poor, poorly equipped. They, can, they cannot even match the AK-47s and everything that these, that these guys had. And one thing he told me that, uh, that stayed with me, he said that um, when they started fighting, they were scared to even shoot at these young, young kids. He said they got to a point where they realized that it, it wasn't young kids that were in front of them because the way they would maneuver with the AK-47, they can kill you in a minute, you understand? So they had, they, they had to fight really hard. But then they were poorly equipped, you know. So during, during that time, during when the war was going on also, we were going through different political situations. Because I think in 1992 or 1993, one of the two, we had a military coup, which was the, young, the younger guys, I mean, in the military land decided to overthrow the government. Because they too, they said because of corruption, they were not pleased because the, the, um, the soldiers were not well equipped to fight the war. So they, they, they conducted a coup. So after that coup, after, the, after that, they, um, I think a year or two later, they, they decided to hand power over to the civilian government. You know. Still, they were not even able to contain the war, and the war was progressing right into the city. So I left in 1991, and I came. But I don't care where, wherever you are. Even if you have the opportunity to leave the country, your loved ones are behind. And just imagine, I was, I was here going to school. I would get calls like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning of our, our parents because they were so scared because the rebels attack a certain area and maybe the next town would be their town. And they had to walk miles, just like Ishmael Bia mentioned. I think, was it in Kabati or whatever, you understand? They had to walk miles, you understand? That's what these people went through. That's what these people went through. And, uh, to end, because I know you guys would want to ask questions. To end, I would say that presently, if you walk around in Sierra Leone, you would see the scars of war. Young, I mean, I hate to say this because it's very painful, but you would see young kids, young kids amputated, their hands amputated. You see young kids of gorgeous, their legs amputated. I don't like to even use the word amputated because when you use the, when you use the word amputated in, in the medical field, it means that maybe somebody is going through maybe you have diabetes, that kind of stuff. The doctors have to take a decision to amputate your leg. You understand? That was not amputation. That was not amputation because nothing is wrong with these people. Nothing was wrong with them. And you're cutting their hands off. You're cutting, you're cutting their legs off. How can, how can human beings so cold? Even, even, even if, you, if you look at our history, we never had to fight. We never had to fight for our independence. The British left because, because we had mosquitoes. Yeah, you know, they were suffering from malaria and all that kind of stuff. We never had to fight. The only, the only war that we grew up in was the hot tax because they imposed taxes on, on the indigenous people and they, were, and they revolted against it by Boer and others who was the leader. So we didn't really have to go through a situation like that. It was the first time in the history of Sierra Leone. I just came back from Sierra Leone and you still walk around and see the images of war, crumbling buildings. And just imagine for a country that is underdeveloped, for a country that the government has it really done much to improve the country since the British left? The little, the little um, um, infrastructures that we have, we are destroyed. So it's not easy to rebuild the country. But let's forget about the country. But, but what about these young kids? They cannot be rehabilitated because the, the, system, the system is not in place to rehabilitate these young kids that has gone through the traumas of war. 
I remember there was a kid who posted something on Facebook. BBC did a documentary on him. I, 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 I shared it with you. And I reached out to him. You should see, because he was a child soldier, you should see this kid crying. How up till now he, he, he is still haunted by the images of what they did, of how they killed people, burn, burn their houses. People were inside and they would burn them alive. You know, so it's, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, I would like to say it's really still a sad time in our history, you know, and every time I talk about it, it brings tears to my eyes because, because that, that's what we were, even though I was here, that's what we went through. That's what we went through as a country, you know, and like my brother, I just have to imagine how, how he was tortured. If you look at Blood Diamond, that's the way they torture people. You know, I just have to imagine. In fact, I did a painting entitled Blood Diamond. If you guys look on the internet, you'll be able to see it. You know, that's how they were tortured. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a period in our life that I think we would never want to revisit. I'll go back to it. But each day I'm scared that it would happen again. Because still, people are going through situations there. We just, had, we just have a new leader by the name of um, Madabio. He pledged to stamp out corruption. And, and he, his head is in the right place. He has the, the I mean, good deeds for the country, he's doing well. But you know, when co corruption has been so em embedded in the society, you have the ones who we are enjoying, who we are getting away from stealing the country's money, the country's wealth, you understand? They are not happy and they don't want to work with them. Okay, but we are just hopeful that things, that things would get, things would get better. And, and if it continues like that, this can happen again. Because it takes a disgruntled, human being who would say, I'm against corruption and I want to do this. But that's not the right way. Because you're not going to say you're fighting for the people, or you're fighting against corruption, and the people you say you're fighting for, you're killing them. You're killing them. It doesn't make any sense. You know? So I will end, and if you guys have questions, I would respond to them. Any questions? Do you know if the United Nations or African Union did anything about the Civil War? Seriously, um, I think um, the world at large were insensitive to what was going on until a friend of mine by the name of Soria Samura, because when I, when I had my exhibition in Sierra Leone, he was the one who recorded my exhibition, he risked his life and went to Sierra Leone and recorded the war, and recorded the war, and um, and it was aired. I think it was aired. In fact, I don't know if it's. I don't remember if it was in Amsterdam before. Then after that, CNN aired it. I've forgotten the title, but I think it's Cry Free Town or something like that. That's when. That's when people started responding. Yeah, you understand. But they were completely insensitive, and I know that Britain, Britain was involved. But the other thing that bothers me. You have United Nations. Why can't they have a ratification and, 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 and prevent kids under a certain age to be first to fight in a war? You know, up to now, I don't think they are able to, uh, to enact any, any law like that because certain countries are against it. They don't want to vote for it. Because if they had done that, that would have prevented it. You know, so um, they tried, and um, towards the end, that's, that's how we ended up having the peace treaty in, in 2002 in Sierra Leone. You know, but then, look all the lives that have been lost. Thousands of people, you know. Yes, you were going to ask a question. Um, did your like, um, experience in Sierra Leone, like Sierra Leone impact your decision to go into fine arts? No, not necessarily, but I think it made me, it made me a better artist. Because um, when I was in graduate school, 
while while other other students in the in, in the art program were interested in in creating abstract. For me, that that was symbolic of blood. Yeah, that and, and, yeah, green and those earth colors were 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 symbolic of death to me. And um, when I when I saw that movie, Cry, I think it's, it's Cry Fritter by Soyuz Samuel. One of the painful imaging in that in that was when they shot this whole old man, and this man was on was on the ground. You know, his his hands clenched, fighting for his life, and then a younger a younger kid, a kid, pointed the gun and blew his head off. And I was asking myself, why why do you even have to do that? This man was going to die anyway. You know, so I started using my paintings to speak against what was going on in Sierra Leone, the atrocities of war. And within my paintings, really, I didn't see them as, as victims. I saw these people as, as um, icons or heroes of the movement, uh, you know, um, heroes of the, of the trauma that they went through. I remember when I was doing that painting of the man on the floor, it's in a museum presently, his hands clenched. I was painting his hand and because I'm a realistic painter and his hands had no life to me. It was after midnight in my studio at Rutgers University. I left, I went for work. Because you can access the building at any time. I came back into No, no, before I left. I was I was so annoyed I started applying this thick paint on his head. You know, in aggression. Because it was a painful period for me. I started applying this thick paint. Then I left. When I came back, I opened, I opened my studio. It, it felt as if his hands had life to me. Because now it wasn't about his hands, but I was using the medium the juxtaposition of the paint, the way I was applying the paint thickly, you understand, it, it became a syntax in the piece for me, you know. So, so I was able to bring, because that's what I wanted to do. I don't, I, I don't see them as victims, I wanted to bring them. Even if you look at um, Blood Diamond, this is a child peering into the future, but, but I didn't paint the blood, I just used the color as a symbolic expression of blood. Because people are coming into the gallery, I don't want to frighten them and painting it so realistically. So, so it was more a symbolic gesture the way I tried to speak about it. And it was a good thing for me because um, somebody, somebody from America actually went and, 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 and volunteered in Sierra Leone based on, on my work. You know, so um, it, it was a means for me to share, to share my story, my pain, my anger, and you can feel it within the painting because that's what I was going through. Yeah. Any, any other question? From this side? I don't want you guys to feel traumatized, okay? It's, it, it, it's over now. It's over now, yes. When, like, okay. So when did you, when do you think the most um, impactful resources created change within Sierra Leone. So when did, so obviously media got out mm -hmm. letting people become sensitive to the subject. Mm -hmm. when, when do you think this happened and what do you think caused that change? Because, because the, um, the rivers were now in the city. They were in the city. And things, it was really bad. Three o'clock in the morning, our parents called, we could hear the, the RPG in the background, the bombs going off, you know, the, the, the guns raging in the air, we could hear it. It was really bad. Now the world, the world realized that um, we have to put an end to this. So that's, that was when, and that was in 2002, I think, was it in June or July, something like that, when, when they decided that 
there should be a peace talk. And for me, why? It's not even legitimate to have a peace talk with a, with a labor leader who had committed all of that. Those people should be tried. They should be tried for the atrocities that they had committed. And Charles Taylor, and Charles Taylor was arrested in Liberia. You know? So, so anyone who was involved in that, look how, they, look how they destroyed lives. Lives. You know? Whether you're living or whether you're dead, look how they, look how they destroyed lives. I went to, I, I, I just came from Sierra Leone and um, we went for my um, wife's um, dad's funeral. When we got to the cemetery, I, I told my wife, I said, we, we are oppressed when we are alive. And we are even oppressed when we are dead. Because if you see the cemetery, it's sad. Honestly, if it's in America, none of those people would be in business. It's like no respect for the dead. It looks like a garbage, like a garbage dump. Can you imagine you, you're taking your loved one to go and bury your loved one in a place like that? And, and that is the reason why I always say that um, there are a lot of things that you guys take for granted here. But when you travel, you would realize how fortunate how fortunate you are, whether it's an education, you know, because you know how many young kids are not having education in the world? You know how many young parents cannot afford it? To, to even go to school, it's a privilege because you have to pay. We just, we just, I mean, this new leader just, just gave free, free education. But when I was going to school, we had to pay for education. We had to pay. My parents were poor. My parents were poor. A couple of times I was kicked out of school because my parents couldn't afford to pay my my school fees, even when I finish, even when I finish um, high school, it took, it took almost three to four years for me to go to college because my parents could, could not afford it. They couldn't. And to get a scholarship in Sierra Leone, you have to be, you must have political influence. It's not based on your credentials. You must have connections. It's not like here where you guys would go to guidance and you have a 4.0 or 3.5, and they're giving you scholarships, they're doing all of this. No, 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 not in Sierra Leone. Honestly, honestly, you with the right credential would have the scholarship. Somebody who, is, who doesn't even have that GPA would have the scholarship because they have political connection. Yeah, for three years, I couldn't go to college. I was so frustrated. When I say frustrated, I was frustrated beyond every reason for three years until the economic um, community, there was a scholarship um, that, they, that, that they offered, and, and I was one of the recipients of that scholarship. That's how I went to college in Sierra Leone. So even when I finished, I, I couldn't still, I mean, get to university because it was a teacher training college. Because they didn't have a degree program for the arts at the time. You know, so you guys, you guys are fortunate. That's why every time I have the opportunity, I always like to encourage you guys, take advantage of the opportunity you have. You are the future leaders of the world, you understand? Like, what is going on now in the world? These are your peers. These are your peers. Every country in the world, these are your peers that are being forced to commit all these atrocities. Can you do something about it? Yes. Even writing letters to the United Nations as, as a class, or as a school, you understand? You can make a you, you, you can make a change. You can make a difference. Michael Jackson said, "We have to look at ourselves in the mirror, right?" So that's all we, we need to do. Just look at ourselves in the mirror and see what we can do. Thank you so much, Mr. Gary.